Good evening, everybody. This is uh, Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and we're here with not just another of our virtual events, but the last virtual event of what's been a real gangbusters year for us, despite all the strangeness that's going on in the world. Jane and I were just talking about that. Um, but we have Jane Cleland with us, and she's going to be discussing her brand new book, Jane Austen's Lost Letters, which has gotten a fabulous write-up uh, today in the USA. Was it USA Today, right? USA Today, one of five books not to miss. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. I'm very and excited. That Yeah, that's going to reach a whole lot of people. Um, and, and just today, we got our autographed copies in the mail. So I will go ahead and put a link to them in the comments field, uh, should you wish to purchase one. And I'll also be monitoring the, the comments in the chat or whatever it's called on Facebook and YouTube. So if you have questions for Jane, go ahead and put them in throughout the hour. And Barbara will bring me back towards the end. I'll be happy to ask any of your questions. So Barbara, over to you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Well, Jane, a toast to you. Now, I went out and looked for my Malice Domestic beautiful cup and saucer. And unfortunately, our housekeeper put them up on the top shelf and I can't reach them without a ladder. But Jane, Jane has behind her her Malice Domestic teapots. So why don't you hook one and show us congratulations for winning them. Tell us what they are. Oh, thank you. Um, they are the Agatha Awards given out by the Malice Domestic Conference, which is traditional mysteries, uh, celebrating traditional mysteries. And the two awards were for nonfiction, actually. One for mastering suspense, structure, and plot, and one for mastering plot twists. Those are my two books in the craft of writing. And I will mention that I offer monthly free webinars on the craft of writing. If you go to my website, janecleland.com, navigate to events, you'll find a listing. You have to register so we know where to send you the link, but they are free. And I spend a lot of time, Barbara, thinking about and researching nonfiction, the craft of writing, because I'm trying to raise the bar in my own writing. I'm trying to get better at it. So I study and think and look for patterns and reach conclusions about what may or may not work. And that's what I talk about um, to help clarify my own thinking and to share the knowledge. Well, you've, um, this is your 14th book, Jane Austen's Long, Long Lost Letters, sorry, um, yes. in the Josie Prescott series. And I have read them all and really enjoyed them. And actually, I'm glad I couldn't find my own Malice Domestic. This is a, actually, this is a Harvey, uh, Fred Harvey, um, mug from La Posada Hotel in Winslow, Arizona, which has this, this is what the Santa Fe Railroad used to have on its China. Beautiful. But anyway, my Malice Domestic Award is just for being old. So yeah, it is, no, it is. It's a Lifetime Achievement Award, which they give you if you just hang around long enough. So um, Jane's is, is well-earned and mine is sort of accidental. So well, it isn't, it isn't just lifetime, it's achievement. You well, are very maybe. special, Barbara. Well, thank you very much, Jane. I'm delighted that you think so, and I think you are too. So I had a little debate with myself today because I realized that, you know, increasingly books are um, are categorized into various genres, and the cozy genre has had a major uptick. And we saw a lot of cozies, and we have a cozy specialist, John Charles, on our staff, um, also a romance uh, women's fiction specialist. And I can't quite put Josie there. I think of her more as a traditional mystery. And, um, and, and in many ways, I think they're procedurals, Jane, because you know, she, she investigates the case almost like a private eye, except that they are mostly personal to her and arise from various aspects of the antiques business. So why don't you tell us your own professional background for those who don't know it, because you have a, a really nice platform on which you write these books. First of all, Barbara, let me just say that as such an interesting comment, I certainly have always thought of them as traditional, not cozies. Cozies are, you know, both traditional and cozy mysteries share four attributes, right? There's an amateur sleuth, there's that personal connection between the killer and the victim. There's no random serial killers or anything like that. There's no, no onstage graphic anything in terms of violence, sex, cussing, <laughs> nothing like that. And no or little forensics. 
So they, both traditional and cozy share those, but where they diverge, I think, is in the ethos, in the attitude. And mine are, I think, I think more serious, a little bit more literary, less playful. And that's not a judgment call. That's literally what they are. Cozies are great fun. I think mine is a little more serious. The procedural really interests me because I am a methodical sort of gal. And I think that translates into the way Josie acts and what she does. My background, which you asked about, refers to her expertise, right? In order for an amateur sleuth to have an, a logical, non-contrived reason for doing her research, she has to be in an occupation or a place or have some kind of reason to be going around and meeting people. And in Josie's case, she's an antiques appraiser, which allows her to go into rich people's houses and uh, museums and ask questions and delve into the facts about things. My background is I owned a rare bookstore for four years. And when you deal in rare books, you sort of automatically are drawn into a little bit of the antiques world as well. Because you know those books are sitting on a bookshelf. And if people like rare books, they're going to have a quill pen and they're going to have the the beautiful amoir and so on. And they, if people are downsizing, for example, they're going to want to get rid of everything, not just the books. And it makes it easier for them if you get it all, which means you have to become good at researching anything. And that's my background and my orientation. And that's the occupation I gave Josie. Well, one of the reasons I don't think of them as cozies, um, but rather traditional mystery, um, is that you've you've created a place for Prescott's Antiques in a seaside New Hampshire town. Um, and because it's an antiques business and where it is, it draws in all kinds of people. It draws in visitors, you know, shoppers, fellow antiquarians, you know, the whole nine yards. So you avoid that that trap of, you know, a very small town where people are decimated. The Cabot <laughs> Cove kind of a syndrome. The Cabot Cove effect, really, right? You know, it's realistic, you know, that, that there's a constant influx of people. And you've also been really good at turning over the staff at Prescott Antiques or bringing them along and changing their roles and so forth. So that, you know, is a good part. The other part is, and you've been a business owner and I'm a business owner, is that many of the businesses that the Cozy Mystery detectives run don't support their detective work. You can't really, you know, just hang up a sign and say gone sleuthing on the bookstore <laughs> and or or the dog sitting business or the chocolate shop or the bake or whatever it is. And you know, it's people have to make a living and you can't you can't divert all your energy from your business to happily go off sleuthing. So Josie is, is actually created sort of an empire. I mean, when we started, Prescott Antique was pretty small, but every time, every book, you've added stuff. So now she has her own TV show and she's built her own TV studio at Prescott Antiques. And that's kind of where this begins. So why don't you give us a little synopsis of the plot? <laughs> Thank you. You know, it's funny. It's like I get an alter ego. I get to grow a business without actually doing the work. Right. I know. it. I've thought about that. You know, this is kind of a, a platonic idea. This exactly. is the platonic ideal of an antiques business. And Josie is able to constantly do all this expansion and all, but somehow there's never any financial fallout. I like that. Jim Wang once reviewed the books as that I created the workplace where everyone wants a job. And I really loved that review. And it's a tribute to Josie. Uh, in this book, in Jane Austen's Lost Letters, Josie is surprised during the filming of one of the episodes of her TV show that a woman has arrived, an elegant woman in her 70s, who says, she, she has to see her urgently. Josie runs out. She says that she was a good friend of her father's. Well, Josie's dad, with whom she was very close, died 20 years earlier. 
and she thought she knew everything about him. So how could this woman have been a good friend of his and Josie never have heard of her at all? The woman hands her a package and dashes away and won't say anything else and just leaves. So here's this woman, Veronica Sutton. She gives her a green leather box, green in the shade that was her father's favorite color. And inside the box is a note from him that he never got to deliver. I'm not gonna say why. And two letters in archival sleeves that are on personal size stationery, <laughs> round ink, yellowed paper. You can imagine Josie's reaction. She looks down, they're both signed by Jane Austen. One from 1811, one from 1814. Could she really have just been given two letters by one of the world's most beloved authors? And that's what the book's about. Very true. Now, instantly, for those of us who know anything about rare books or whatever it is, the first question is, can they be real? Are they forgeries or what are they? So the whole question of authentication is important. And by happy chance, well, not really because Jane plotted it this way. But anyway, um, the, the, two, the two experts that, um, Josie's show is not like the Antiques Roadshow. It's not like people are showing up in, at least I don't think it is. Um, oh, in this right. particular episode, she's interviewing experts and what she wants to discuss is the process of authentication. So it's not like you're bringing a cuckoo clock, you know, and, and wanting to find out if it's genuinely, you know, from Munich or Westphalia or wherever cuckoo clocks are primarily made, the Black Forest. Um, and so, you know, do you ever explain, I don't want to give anything away here, why the letters happen to show up when the authentication process is going on? Maybe I shouldn't ask that question. Well, Josie, always on the TV show, whatever antique is being featured, there is always a discussion about the authentication process. Um, the other antique that's featured yeah. in this book is Thimbles. And uh, her employee, Fred, who is one of the antiques appraisers, has been working on the thimble collection. And we learn throughout it what materials are used in thimbles, how rare German thimbles are compared to British thimbles, um, how they're decorated, why they're decorated, and so on. In other books, whatever the antique is, the authentication process is always discussed. Right. Specifically, we have to look at whether an antique, in this case letters, how rare are they and how scarce are they? That scarcity has to do with how many are extant. If a thousand were made and there's only two left, that's pretty scarce. We look at condition, price, based on current trends, something called association, right. which refers to whether anyone important or interesting owned this thing that adds a little luster to it, separate from the thing itself. And there are other factors as well, but those are the primary ones. In this case, the two people that are being interviewed in the show happen to be looking at a Beatrice Potter book, Peter Rabbit. And she brought them in because she uses a variety of documentation and other kinds of experts. And it happened to be that they got wind of these letters and were like, let me be the one to authenticate it. I can do it. <laughs> I thought it was fun. <laughs> well, I mean, there are all kinds of tests you can run. You know, you can run tests on the paper. You can run tests on the ink. And, you know, you can look at the pen to see if it's typical of a Jane Austen. I mean, if, it was that, if it's a ballpoint pen, you've already ruled the whole thing out. Um, and then known examples of her of her own signature. Um, and of course, today with, you know, so much stuff online, it's not that difficult to get an image of a signature, um, you know. Yeah, but that won't help you with 3D in terms of pressure points. Right. And, and, the, and the like. There are things you still need to examine under a microscope in person. And one thing I will say about the, the premise of this book is that scholars agree that Jane Austen, who wrote just daily letters. She probably wrote more than 3,000 letters in her lifetime. 
And as far as is known, only 161 are extant. Her sister, later in the sister's life, decades after Jane Austen died, burned the rest. Right. Reasons unknown. It's unclear why. Why didn't she burn them all? Why did she burn these? That's up for speculation, and I do discuss it in the book. But the fact remains that you notice that I said, as far as is known, right. I think it's completely credible, completely credible that there are other letters out there buried in someone's attic that it's been in the family for the two or 300 years, uh, the house has been, and it's been a collected item for the 200 odd years since the letter might have come into that person's possession. And they just don't found it yet. Well, I think you're right. I mean, Cassandra Austin, Jane's sister, did burn what Jane possessed, but that doesn't mean the recipients of the letters didn't end up keeping them. She could only burn the ones that were in Jane's estate, so to speak. So yeah, yes, I think right. you're, yeah. you're probably right. You know, one, one of the places that we've been discovering um, older manuscripts is that oftentimes manuscripts and so forth were used in book binding as you know, from being a rare book. So, you know, in the process recently, I can't remember where, of taking apart a book to, you know, restore it and work on the binding, out fell, you know, padding that was used behind generally the leather covers that had, wow. I don't remember, what, what was it recently? It was something in the last couple months that- Wow, really? Yeah, and I don't remember what it was. You know, it's not like a lost Shakespeare play because you're not going to have room for all that, but- very often it's fragments of things or or letters or, you know, whatever it all is. Whatever so, was handy. Yeah, and there's still um, a lot of libraries that, um, you know, have been in families for generations or centuries or whatever it may be. And who knows, you'd have to take apart all those books, you know, in order to see what was in them. But yeah. anyway, yeah, no, I agree with you. I think it's perfectly plausible that there are some Austin letters and you know it was such an act of I, you can't really call it literary piracy but the other one I've always really felt terrible about was the Victorian window of um, uh, Sir Richard Francis Burton the discoverer you know of, with John Speak the guy that went and found the source of the Nile but he was a uh, an amazing scholar and student of, or, you know, he, he actually did the Hajj, you know, and disguise and all these other things. And he was, he, he, he made a ridiculous marriage. And um, she was a very proper Victorian and a lot of what he had was erotica. So she burned it all. And, you know, I've always thought weep. Um, I've always, I'm always urging authors to think about their literary estates. You wanna have an estate and you wanna have an executor that is not related to you and will not profit from your, uh, from your work and will take care of it. And, you know, oh, and, I see, because if someone is related to you and if someone's related to you and will profit, they will be looking out for their own interest. Exactly. Yes, there's a, a notable thing that's just happened. I'm not gonna go into names, but recently something was announced that where that clearly um, is is an issue, um, but you know a lot of it depends on whether, depending on, on on how successful the author is or what the author's situation is, some authors are happy to have other people continue writing their work, and other authors would like to take it to the grave with them. Right. And if you don't if you don't take care of that, um, this is a message to all writers out there. If you don't take care of that, you are then at the mercy of whoever inherits your estate and, um, and they can follow their own. Right, they get to make those decisions. Exactly, not you. so, you know, I think it's important. And Jane obviously um, didn't get a voice in or didn't prepare um, for Cassandra there. I don't know, given all the laws at the time about women and women's property and all, I don't really have any idea what kind of rights Jane really owned and whether she could, in fact, her personal papers, whether she could have done something with them, but you know, we can just speculate on that. Anyway, the other reason I think that I, I tend to think of your books as procedurals is that the, the hook or the problem that every amateur sleuth book has is that amateur sleuths don't have the power of arrest. So they almost always have to bring in a legitimate law enforcement officer, whether it's the FBI or you know a local policeman or whatever it might happen to be. 
But Josie has had a long-term relationship with law enforcement, is actually married to somebody that was in law enforcement. And so that, I think, kind of highlights the procedural aspect of it too, don't you? I can see that. I, she, I really can see that. She knows how to do some things, but she also has a very clear understanding on what not to do. And that doesn't always please her. She would like to skirt the law a little bit. She tries to a couple of times in this book and gets thwarted. You know, I, I often think, I think it's very important for authors of traditional mysteries I'm not talking about other kinds of crime fiction where this may actually be a thing, but authors of the kind of books I write, I think it's very important that we're very respectful to law enforcement, that we never try, we never try to make our amateur sleuth look smarter than them. They need to be allied. They need to find out things that the actual police people can't find out. In Josie's case, it's her antiques expertise. And I, I always position things very carefully that the police are appreciative of her help. They may object a little bit to her assertiveness. That's a polite way of saying it, but they appreciate what she does and what she knows and what she can help them find out that is a real shortcut for them. It would take them so much longer if they had to find the experts themselves and do the research themselves and so on. So I think, in that sense, I think the part, it's more of a partnership, a collaboration yeah. than it is anything competitive. And I, in talking to authors out there, I would be very careful about making it competitive. That will backfire on you. I mean, you're not allowed to obstruct justice. You're not allowed to withhold evidence and so on. And it's just the wrong thing to do. And these books have a very strong perspective of right and wrong, order out of chaos. Very true. That was one of the things that I like about them. Another interesting feature of this book, um, I think the best mysteries, and I've said this many times before, are ones where you really mourn the victim. You know, if the victim is just kind of a stooge in there, you know, to kick off the plot, which can happen oftentimes, um, then you don't have any emotional connection. The fact that this person has been killed, doesn't really bother you. And really, in theory, shouldn't bother the people around them much. It becomes more like a puzzle than anything personal. But yes. I thought, Jane, to be honest, when I plunged into the book, um, I expected a different person to be the victim. And I won't go Ooh. into it. I did. Um, and then and then you, you made the person who is killed so engaging. I was really upset. I'm, I'm pleased by that. Um, my wonderful former editor, the late Hope Dillon, who was really a, a wonderful St. Martin's editor, and Ben Sevier, who was the acquiring editor before her, both told me exactly what you just said. You have to make the reader care deeply about the victim, and therefore don't attempt to kill them before page 40. So when you think about the typical writer advice, writer's advice of you jump in with the inciting incident. Right. Yeah, okay. But the inciting incident isn't the murder. That's a consequence of what has incited that event. So you start with building the connections and the relationship and setting the betrayal or the obsession or the whatever is the motive behind the murder. You set that emotion. That's the inciting incident. In this case, the murder happened later than it's ever happened in any of my other books. It was really, I think it was close to page 90, um, which is really quite far along. Very true. And as I said, I thought we were going down a different path. So it was like, whoa, here we go. <laughs> um, and the, it, it also, I think it, that we should say, but the book is not, is not really about Jane Austen. It's much more about Josie's relationship with her father. Um, and, but in a way that is sort of Jane Austen because Jane Austen really wrote about family and family dynamics, parents and children, you know, sisters, brothers, lovers, whatever. Um, so 
in a way, you're mirroring Jane Austen, I think, in this book. You're not so much writing about Jane Austen. Oh, heart be still, Barbara. <laughs> you know, taking on a project like this, it, it takes a certain amount of sass, you know? I, I was so, it was so important to me that Jane Austen, the Jane Austen community thought I did a respectful job. Yeah. I didn't want to do anything that was not appropriate to the subject matter. So thank you. That's that's a, a wonderful compliment. Well, I mean, you know, it does it does really up in Josie's world or Josie's idea of what her family or her relationship with her father was when this woman comes along and says, "Hi, you know, here I am." And you, so I I think, and it it make it really throws her off. I I think yeah. Josie is more flustered and uncertain than I can recall her in other books. She's so thrown by that. It really, it changes her view of the world. Yeah. It, when you think you know something with 100% certainty, and then plunk, here comes a fact that upends your certainty, you no longer can trust your judgment about anything. It isn't just that one thing. It, 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 it's a ripple effect. It changes everything in your world. Very true. Now, I mean, it's it's a very interesting book. In some ways, it's more of a character study, you know. Well, it is not more of. It is in addition to the mystery. It's also a character study. Um, and I like the fact that Josie can look at herself, you know, because most of the time she's investigating other people. But in this case, she's actually having to look deeply into herself. Now, she has a wonderful husband, but he's what? Where is he in this book? Because you know, you, you've kind of he used to be, Ty used to be more involved in the mysteries, but now he's often off stage for quite a lot of it. Well, he's on, he's been off stage for a lot of books. There was one right. book where uh, maybe book three or four, somewhere in there. And my editor said, you know, you're kind of creating a situation in which Josie has all these men around her. There's Wes, the reporter who helps her. There's Max, the lawyer. There's Chief Hunter, the new police chief her at that time boyfriend Ty it's like get you gotta get Ty out of town I gave him a sick aunt in California Aunt Trina she died I'm afraid and so he was out there spending time and settling the estate but I'm very careful to get the men away so that it can be Josie's story right no I know but I mean he's been there for backup um and you know he's um an entree at one point I seem to me didn't we discuss this last year that because he's now in DC a lot that Josie might actually have a mystery that is in part outside of New Hampshire yeah we did and you see how that came to a resolution in this book yep I'm not saying anything no 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 but I mean I think I think that's a perfectly plausible you know, when, you, when you've written 14 books and are looking ahead towards whatever number you're planning to write, um, I do think it's, it's interesting. Readers don't want to let go of the core, you know, the, the community that you've created and all the rest of it. Right. Yeah. But it does get interesting to take them out of town. I think about Archer Mayer. We may have talked about Archer, who writes, you know, these fabulous books set in Vermont, the Joe Gunther series. And I think he's on book. 32 by now, something like that, 30 something. Anyway, Joe is a cop in Vermont. So all of the books have a Vermont core, but Archer has taken him to Rhode Island. He's taken him to Manhattan, I'm trying to remember in different books. And, you know, it adds, a, a, it adds some extra vitality, I think, to change the scene. Well, perhaps I have been told Josie can't leave New Hampshire. Well, not for the whole book, but, you know, you could have yeah, her. May, oh, no, I've had her go to Boston a couple of times yeah. and New York a couple of times. So she can travel, but the mystery has to be set in New Hampshire. And mostly that's because of Wes Smith, the reporter, because Wes um, works for a local newspaper. And so they won't cover national stories. Right. Well, I just think, you know, sometimes you can open it up with a field trip, so to speak. Um, <laughs> And, you know, maybe you also had an idea. I'm going to interrupt you, Barbara, forgive me, sure. but you had a great idea last year that has really been ruminating in my back burner that she ought to start a business that doesn't work, that every time she expands in yeah. some way, it just poof, it's successful. What would happen if she tried something and it didn't work? 
So I think I'm going to be looking at that at some point. I think that's a great idea. And, you know, here's my own watchword, you know, never bet the whole farm. You can afford to take risk if it's if it's managed risk. Um, you know, you can you can you can lose like 20 percent or something and still survive. And I think, you know, businesses can't really progress if they don't evolve and don't um, and don't do that. And every once in a while you are going to take or have a misstep. And I think that would be very, very interesting and very realistic for her to to try that. Um, but she, you know, doesn't need to put her in terrible peril. It would probably be more more of an emotional wound than it would be a financial wound. Uh, yeah, a know. loss of confidence, perhaps. Well, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know that I, I made a, a step or two with the, with the poison pen that, you know, didn't work out and, and I didn't lose any confidence in it. I just recognized that um, either, either we didn't have all the information or it was interesting because when we, our second store, which was, seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, and we tried it and we were actually shut down by the project that we went into because the guy that developed it didn't bother to get permits from the city. So one day the city showed up and shut it down, turned off all the power, said, you know, you don't have any permits, whatever it is, you can't operate here. Now I had written the lease myself, drawing on my, you know, whatever legal knowledge I have, whatever. And we had an exit. Um, and so I sat down with the staff and I said, you know, I don't, I don't think this has really gone in the direction that we wanted to. And they said to me, you know, our mistake here, our mistake here was not recognizing that the poison pen is about us. It's not about the bookstore. It's not about books. It's really about us. And we can't clone ourselves. We can't be in two locations. And so why don't we take the equipment and the other stuff that we, you know, bought to, for, and why don't we expand the building that we're in? And why don't we, why don't we recognize that we need to develop the business in that direction? And so we I did, and now, now we've taken over the building, you know, so uh, it was the right thing, but it was a group decision, which I thought was really interesting that my staff were self-aware and, and probing enough to recognize that they didn't want to do that. But, and you asked them, or you yeah. were transparent about it, and you wouldn't have realized, they wouldn't perhaps have realized the essence of Poison Pen had you not made that misstep. Well, that's very true. And fortunately, you know, in a, from a tax position, if you, if you haven't lost everything, and I mean, obviously it was a costly mistake in some respects, but you can make some of it back, um, you know, if you have a good right. account. And we have, a, we have an excellent CPA, I'm happy to say. And so you can try, it's sort of like, you know, if you have lemons, make lemonade or something. But if you, if you just lost a bunch of money on, on a business development, you can, in fact, turn it, you know, into, if not, right. a, not an asset, but you can make it less tragic by, you yes. know, figuring out how to apply it to your taxes. But I thought it was an important lesson. Maybe that's why I said to you, I think it would be good for you. I didn't lose any confidence. It just, you know, gotcha. it was a reality check. And Josie has the kind of staff where she could do the same thing. Yes, I can see that. That's a gr I'm so glad you shared that, Barbara. That's great. Well, it was, um, and you know, the other good thing about it was it all happened in 2007. So when the financial disaster hit in 2008, yeah, I mean, the timing, there's a lot of luck involved. And I think it's been true for Josie too. I mean, you have to kind of, you know, read the tea leaves or scent the air or something, but yeah, but yeah there's, I, there's a certain amount of luck involved in any successful venture. Well, certainly timing. Yeah. Um, you know, I think there's a lot we can do to mitigate bad luck and enhance good luck, but we can't do anything about timing. No, it's absolutely true. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the authentication process because that is really um, such a great feature of this book and you've got your two experts. So did you have to do a lot of research or did you know enough about it from your rare book business? No, I had to do, I, for every book, I do a huge amount of research. In this case, I researched um, two things separately. I researched Jane Austen's letter writing practices which required researching the stationery she used 
and where she bought it and how often she bought it, um, how she made the ink. She made her own ink. Gall ink is what it's called. I researched her business practices because she actually was very involved with the business aspects of her publishing career and wrote many letters about that. I researched how she felt about her nieces and nephews because that was a lot of the subject matter of her letters. And there's a, one of the first collections of her letters that came out in 1892. And the editor of that compilation made the point that during the period she was working, there were huge life-changing events. America's effort to become a free nation and the War of 1812 is what we would call it, and uh, Egyptian wars. And just, it, the Brits were involved in a lot of stuff that was um, really taking, was a counterpoint to her love and mindfulness of the minutia of daily life. And she ignored it all. The only thing she paid attention to were things that affected her directly. She had two brothers in the Navy, for example. And so if a book came out that talked about the Navy and named the officers, she was likely to have read it to see if her brothers were mentioned. Other than that, she talked about trimming her hats and making cabbage pudding. From her letters, she was so content. She seemed sublimely happy with her life. So that was one whole set of research. The other whole set of research was in the authentication of any document. And that is a whole field and people get validated by courts, which means they have expertise that will be accepted in as evidence in a, a procedure. And it was fascinating to me because their expertise is so specialized. Mm -hmm. One person is just a signature expert. That, that's really their field of expertise. Another knows everything about paper. A third knows everything about ink. Uh, and they can even tell through various brand new technology in the last year or so, they can tell whether original ink, gall ink, written on original paper was written recently so that it is getting harder and harder to commit that kind of fraud. Um, there's been some really remarkable work done with x-rays, uh, these super duper x-ray machines, finding paintings behind paintings. Right. I'm, I'm digressing a little from Jane Austen, but just as an aside that, you know, artists, couldn't always afford new canvases. So they just whitewashed over the last work. And so they're finding with Degas and Renoir and Rembrandt, they're finding earlier works that the artists were dissatisfied with and they just painted over. Astonishing. It is astonishing. And you know, you earlier mentioned pressure points. And so tracing a signature would, would be an entirely different thing than writing a signature. So that would be one thing you could, I mean, there's some really hilarious stories about authenticating signatures. My favorite is the, um, the Confederacy of Dunces, whose the author's name has slipped my mind, but do you know that story? No, I don't think so. Well, there was a, a guy who was making a killing selling autographed books and everybody marveled at, you know, where did he find these absolutely amazing <laughs> yeah, autographed books and so forth. And, and he was doing well until one day he put out a autograph by the author copy of a Confederacy of Dunces and his entire empire came down like a crash. Thank you. Patrick's telling me it was John Kennedy tool. And the reason that it brought everything to a halt was that John Kennedy Toole died before his book was ever printed and published. <laughs> and therefore, you know. Oh, that's wonderful. I know. Um, so it's a posthumous signature, which then became sort of a thing. Um, but, you know, it's, it's interesting how, how um, people who are, you know, that's such an elementary slip. You have to ask yourself, you know, how, I think, it, I don't know if it was overconfidence or whatever, but 
he outed himself essentially right. you know he was going along and i've always thought that was just such a i want you remember i don't know if you ever read the books by john dunning book to die was just yes. a remarkable book and one of the books in before he unfortunately developed a brain tumor and his literary career came to a halt but he wrote i'm trying to remember maybe five five or six books with cliff janeway the rare books former cop rare book expert and all they were fabulous and one of them was about signatures. Um, and I don't remember the title, whichever one it was. Yeah, I read it years ago and I don't remember yeah. either. But it was really, it was excellent. It was really a person that pushed people to a great degree. The success of Book to Die pushed people into collecting um, first printings, autographed first printings of first editions, you know, because he, he taught the average person about stuff. I mean, people would buy that book and they'd rush home and open up their libraries, you know, and look <laughs> to see, you know, is it this or that? Um, I, I was so, so saddened by, you know, his, his illness. I mean, to take away the thing that made him, his brain, um, right. you know, made him so remarkable and so special was a really heartbreaking kind yes. of a thing. Um, but anyway, um, you know, the whole thing of authentication, whether it's paintings or whether it's books or whether it's signatures or whether it's whatever is a fascinating world and they're always going to be slips and, oh. it, and you know that is one of the first things that the experts in Jane Austen's lost letters talk about is one of the things they look for is would this author would this person whether it's a president or whomever would he or she have written that thing at that right. time in his or her life sure it's like your bank checking your you know looking at your checks you know what's what's the history of your check writing would you really have written a check for a thousand dollars to so and so, and there's zero, you know. Um, I think we're more conscious of of that kind of security today. And, and the one thing we also haven't mentioned in this whole conversation is what kind of value is assigned to the Jane Austen letters? How much money are they worth? Because if somebody has gone to the trouble, and we, I'm not saying whether they did or not, to forge a Jane Austen letter, then the payoff has to be worth the trouble. Well, um, perhaps if that's why they did it, if someone is oh. going to forge something for money, then yes, it would have to be worth the trouble. But there are other reasons why people yeah. might forge something. Um, just saying that, that it's not always about money. But in terms of a literal question of what would in a new, previously unseen Jane Austen letter that was authenticated as having been written by her, um, what would it be worth in today's market? And I think the answer is probably close to priceless. I think the museums that might be interested in it and the two, the Jane Austen um, Museum in England and the JP Morgan Library here in New York, uh, they have eight of those letters. Eight, I think it's eight. Might, maybe I'm rem remembering the Byron letters. It might even be more than that. But they have a, a notable collection of Jane Austen letters and they have the money to buy uh, on the open market, whereas some smaller museums like the Jane Austen Museum would not. But I don't know how you would set that price. And so it would go to auction and there are likely to be private collectors that have all the money in the world and bid anonymously. And it would probably go to a private collection for several million dollars. That would be my expectation. I think you're right. But I use the word payoff deliberately because it doesn't, as you say, have to be money. You know, it can be um, it can be ego, it can be all kinds of things, you know, it can be a way to get back at somebody, you know, I have this and you don't. I mean, there are all kinds yes. of so that's that's the right. payoff has to be worth it to the person who might or might not have, you know, created the letter. Yeah. A hundred percent. Right. So, you know, it, I, I think what, whole... what you just said, Barbara, excuse me again for interrupting. Yeah. What you just said reminded me of something that um, I learned from a CIA document um, many years ago about the four reasons why people betray their country. And? And it forms the acronym MICE. Money, ideology, conspiracy, which generally leads to coercion. In other words, they're part of a group and they believe they're pressured by that group. They're bullied or pressured in some way. There's some kind of conspiracy, which leads to coercion. 
And then E is for ego. So those well, I think that that probably applies in this case too. You know, I think you're right. We could knock out the M and call it ice and apply it to January sixth. I think without any trouble at all. So it is. It's certainly not always mm. about money. I think you need to put that M back in, because I think a oh, lot of people are making a lot of money <laughs> fundraising and all the rest. Well, I can't argue with that. Anyway, um, it's really really a delightful book, Jane. So I'm delighted that, um, let me ask you as we call Patrick back to the screen, are you at work on Josie 15? Um, I am right now working on a standalone. You are. I am, Codename Secrets. Ooh. And that's its working title. And it's quite different and I'm very pleased and I've been working on it for years, but now I'm really kind of focused um, and we'll see where it goes. Uh huh. Well, I'm delighted to hear that. I think it, you know it's good to step step out and see what else you can do. Although I certainly hope that Josie will continue to percolate back there. She's, in your she's on she's um on hiatus. She has not fully retired. Good. I'm delighted to hear that. Patrick, do you want to come join us? And thank you for John Kennedy O'Toole, which I should have remembered. Sure. Um, you have any other great forgery stories? That's the one that always sticks in my mind. Um, there have been any number of Harper Lee forgery stories. Uh, yeah. yeah, and people like that who, you know, who rarely, if ever, sign books, uh, that tends to happen from time to time. Matisse, I know not books, but this is an art forgery. Matisse once said that in his lifetime, he painted 1,500 works and 2,500 of them are in America. <laughs> um, let's see, I have a, a couple of questions for you. Uh, Nelly wants to know, she says, is Josie an amalgamation of people you know or a completely unique character? That's a, you know, it's a wonderful question and I don't know that I know the answer. Um, I know that I tried to create someone who was idealized to be the best woman that I knew. And she has some flaws, but I think that her goodness, her essential kindness and empathy and brains and moral compass that is unwavering, those are all qualities I admire. So I would say probably I can look at the good people that I know and I, therefore knew how to write it, but I do think she's unique. Um, I have a couple of people who don't have questions necessarily, but they're just weighing in about how much they enjoy your webinars. Oh, thank you. People. Yeah. Um, I do have a, a kind of a prosaic question for you, which is somebody wants to know, is there a large print version available of this new book or is there one coming? The, it, I think all the books are out in large print. I don't know whether this one has I seen yet. It listed yet, but uh, no, it, it 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 generally comes out about six months after. Right, right. I will say that all of the books are coming out in paperback, from Harlequin, and Ornaments of Death has just become available. So if you go to Harlequin's website, you will find Ornaments of Death. Um. I said all of them, I think it's the last four. All of them are coming out in the British versions that I just signed that contract. Mm. And that's both eBooks and uh, paperback. It's wonderful because we haven't been able to get the paperbacks for a long time. Yeah, I will talk, Barbara. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I'm delighted because this is a series that is really a pleasure to read from the beginning, if you can. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, a, a question just about research. Were there, were there any little uh, chestnuts that when you were researching the, the letters or coming up with your own uh, story about them, anything about Jane Austen that came up in the research that really surprised you? Yes, um, a couple of, I, I was surprised at how direct she was in most of her letters. You just, she just laid it bare. You really, knew that she hated this museum exhibit and 
really was glad she didn't have to spend time with Mrs. So-and-so. And she was very frank to her in her letters to her sister. There was no equivocation. There was no, but you know, I know she's a very nice woman. I'm just glad, you know, she talks too much. It was just, oh my God, get me away from this person. And that, that surprised me. Uh, maybe it shouldn't have, but it did. Hmm. Let's see. Um, anybody else have questions? Let's see. You know, not really. I mean, they're just, they're just weighing in about how much they like the series. Uh, lots of really nice comments. Oh, but uh, not a whole lot of questions tonight for whatever reason. Just because we answered them. It was I think so, yeah. I think you we anticipated. <laughs> we did, actually. So I, well, I have something. I have a quick question for you, Jane. Is there anything, yeah. is there anything uh, that you collect? Any that might surprise readers or, or not? Another really interesting question. Um, for many, many years, I collected etiquette books. Etiquette books uh, really freeze, a, they, they give you a picture of what society's values, standards, mores were at any frozen moment in time. Because if the book was written in 1923, you knew what society expected in 1922, 23. And I found that fascinating. And I had some really wonderful examples um, I, I decided probably for space considerations, since I live in an apartment in New York City, that the time had come to give up my collection. And I found a woman, I made it available on a free site, and a woman who is getting her PhD in some aspect of etiquette through a sociology department uh, was like chomping at the bit for them. So they all went to a good home. Oh, um, that's wonderful. Research. Yeah. You know, it's really too bad that etiquette appears to be neither taught nor read at the moment. I think I think one of the reasons we're in, you know, so fractured and all people have forgotten good manners. You know, just common. What happened and, to a civics class when you were seven years old? Right. <laughs> I know. There are a lot of life skills that, you know, that I was taught when, when I was young. I mean, you know, we had elective things. We could, uh, we had a print shop in junior high school where we all learned how to, you know, set type and print up stuff. There was woodworking classes. You were obliged to take a year of home ec, uh, yep. girls and boys. Um, you had to learn to swim two lengths of the swimming pool before they yep. let you graduate. And this is a really progressive high school. It was one of the best high schools in the United States, New York Township High School in Winnick, Illinois. But they tried to prepare you. Uh, we had handwriting class, all of it. They tried to give you life skills. You know, right. stuff that, and I don't think that that is in the curriculum anymore. And it's amazing how You're people, right. one thing I've really learned in the pandemic is apparently few people know how to cook. I mean, there's the whole thing about celebrity chefs and all of that, but then there seems to be a vast number of people who have absolutely no idea how to cook. Or What's a white sauce? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, so life skills are sadly missing. Well, the best example of how horrible it has really gotten is that Australia decided that all students had to learn to code. Perfectly reasonable skill that people need to learn to code, I yeah. guess, computer codes, but they didn't have room in the curriculum, so something had to go. And what they decided to jettison was geography. Really? So Australian kids no well, I guess they figured the G GPS would take care of it, you know, and nobody, I mean, I, I can't help but feel that, you know, everybody's phone is really a dumbing down thing in so many respects that, wow. It's miraculous, well, but also, but also a dumbing down thing. Yeah, yeah. It, it's both, right. It and really you, is. Yeah, people don't really need research skills anymore, you know, you can just ask Alexa or ask Google or whatever it is. My husband is addicted to asking Google questions. I mean, he's certainly well-educated and no dummy, but I can't tell you how many times I hear him say, hey, Google, <laughs> you know, whatever. What's the meaning I, of usually life? Usually it's trivial. Hmm? So ask Google what the meaning of life is and see what you hear. <laughs> no, it's usually something really small, but you know, yeah. nonetheless, the ease of it is seductive. Absolutely. It really is. So, well, Jane, it's really been a pleasure. You want to hang around a moment after Patrick takes us off live? We can talk for a minute. Sounds so, good. Um, let me encourage you to um, get, we have uh, 
still some copies, some autographed copies of Jane Austen's Lost Letters. And I have to tell you at this point, our chances of getting it to you for Christmas are practically nil uh, because all the delivery services basically are shutting down Christmas delivery as of today or tomorrow. But it's not a book that won't do well in the new year for you. So No, and you can always just put in a little card that says coming. You know, that the, well, we actually have person. gift certificates. I mean, we can we can do gift cards for particular books as well as amounts of money. So you can always ask us to do that. Anyway, thank you all for joining us this evening, Jane. As always, it's been a huge pleasure to talk with you. So you too. Thank you so much for including me. Thank you, Patrick. Absolutely. See you all. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy holidays. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them and your help would be appreciated, please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.